the Hello World Blender Meetup Day, and hello, Blender World. I'm Michael Prosca from Tombstone Tumbleweed Art here in Arizona, United States. Today I'm going to tell you why I rewrote Blender's Ply Importer. But first, I'd like to give a giant thank you with love to the World Blender Meetup Day coordinators for inviting me, and for all of you for listening to me. It's really something that, to be a part of such a fun, awesome, unique, and weird community as the Blender Heads. So, all right, let's get to it. Here is the quick version for those on a tight schedule. In any stock version of Blender, trying to import point clouds from Mandelbulb 3D or JWildfire was <laughs> pointless. Ah. Either you would get no colors, or even worse, a cryptic console error like this one. These beautiful mesh and point cloud files that come out of the later versions of Mandelbulb 3D are completely incompatible. Well, no longer, my friends. I have expanded the stock importer to correctly load all of these things. And now, everybody gets to do stuff like this. The files are available on our GitHub repository, search import ply as verts, and there you'll also find example files and links to our YouTube tutorials. And now, the rest of the talk. Why ply? Why this obsession with ply? That was invented like a million years ago, right? Well, according to Wikipedia, the ply format was developed in the mid-90s by Greg Turk and others in the Stanford Graphics Lab. Mid-90s, huh? How many of you watching this were born after that? That means ply is older than you. So why use such a fossil file format? That's fun to say. Well, ply was invented because the Stanford group was deeply into 3D scanning. You have no doubt seen the bunny, Buddha, and dragon models. All were courtesy of Stanford and still available on their archive. These were laser scanned and archived in, yep, ply. Whatever failings ply may have, it's really good at storing scans in vertex colored point clouds because it was designed for that. And like Wavefront's OBJ format, the other senior citizen on our list, it has a text variety that is relatively easy to write import and export functions for. The problem is, is that ply allows for a number of different flavors, if you will. It's a very loose format, and it sort of relies on an honor system that programmers will stick to the core requirements and not throw strange data in. Because really, you can store anything in a ply file, but then nothing will be able to open it. A Blender stock importer is a fine bit of software. I, I have nothing but love and respect for the original programmers who wrote it. It works very well for regular models which is what it was made for. However, it kind of chokes when we get to weird models. Like, like point clouds, for example. And so attempting to load a vertex colored point cloud in Blender confuses the importer because it expects actual geometry, faces, quads, something like that, and not just vertices and colors. The vertices do come in, but Blender won't even process the color information. Prior to this, the best workaround I found was loading the file into MeshLab, re-exporting it, and then finally loading it back into Blender. Not a huge inconvenience, no, but the dream of native import just drove me on. 
enter Taco Voxel. Back in 2017, I was playing with attaching a particle system to a point cloud. My buddy, J Wildfire Guru Brad Stefanov, asked me, How do we keep the colors of the original fractal? Well, this was years before geometry nodes, so there really wasn't a solution at the time. I thought to myself, well, it's like instancing, really. We just use each vertex in the point cloud as a local origin of a copied mesh and color it accordingly. Okay, well, let's give it a try. This was supposed to take two weeks. The original attempt was using Blender Python, but being such a large geometry operation, it really, really ran slow, and so I went back to my C++ roots. The official first version of Taco Voxel was hammered out not in Visual Studio, not VS Code, but Falcon C++. Very good for prototyping, very lightweight. The program was just a proof of concept, ran in the console like it was 1994, had no preview, but these are the original first images that came out of it, and when I saw these in Blender, I figured, yeah, yeah, this is worth pursuing. And pursue I did. Over the next few years, the project slowly matured. By 2019, we had a fully graphical OpenGL version, and the latest version, migrated the entire code base over into Qt 5. And it was pretty. We'll probably find some use for this someday, but at the moment, its potential has been fulfilled. After all, some very technical issues were never resolved, and I was beginning to wonder if I could even finish the thing. As the Cherno says, making game engines is hard. True that. Then, just back in January of this year, I was trying to get this tutorial by Jimmy Gunawan I hope I pronounced your name right, buddy. To work in 3.1 Alpha. For those who don't know, Geometry Nodes got a big overhaul between 3.0 Official and 3.1 Alpha. I didn't know that either, and I was just blindly plugging nodes in when BAM! It just worked. I later found out this innocent sounding entry in the 3.1 release notes briefly mentions new superpowers in the Realize Instances node. Just like that. Blender is now smart enough to see that you have instanced onto a colored object and understands you'd probably like to use those colors. It's magic, I tell you. Also, just like that, the realization dawned on me that these six nodes right here completely replace Taco Voxel. And it's just the beginning, because this is only the first stage of geometry nodes, and they're just only going to get more awesome. So, I shut down Taco Voxel for now, and immediately put all efforts into figuring out how to get these to import. All we needed now was just to get them in the blender. As it turns out, the color information actually was coming in from the file, but Blender didn't know what to do with it. By spending many, many quality hours with Blender's Python console, I gained much insight into the plumbing and all the beautiful complexity going on under there. For any Patrick Rothfuss fans out there, Blender has a truly epic underthing. Eventually, I saw that the colors needed to be piped into a different data block. A data block that would be compatible with just vertices. And it was there the whole time, this humble custom attribute node, by directing the incoming stream of color data into a new attribute, all of a sudden, we had a successful import. From there, I merged the new import ply as verts option back into the stock importer, so that we now have the best of both worlds. If your file has geometry, you can load as either a mesh or a point cloud. If it's just a point cloud and you forget to check the box, it will detect that in the file and correctly load as a point cloud. And as a bonus, that heartbreaking console error we used to get with the newer Mandelbulb files is fixed. It just works. Okay, so it works. What can we actually do with it? Well, let's go over the point cloud workflow. Let's quickly take a look at this. I won't bore you too badly because I've gone through this on our YouTube channel. But bear in mind, prior to February 5th, this literally was not possible. We are on the bleeding edge of Blender, my friends. 
And this is why the point cloud workflow requires at least 3.1 alpha. So this is the example.blend file from the GitHub page. And this is the basic geometry node tree inside of it called instances. The set material node here references verts, which is this material. Although this call attribute looks like the old vertex color attribute, it is not. Over here in the data panel, we see that there's nothing in the vertex color slot. But down here in attributes, we see it. And we see the type of data we're looking at, vertex color. That's a little confusing. So it's vertex color, but it's not the old vertex color. We kind of have the same name for different things, but for clarification, if we add a new vertex color block up here, it shows up with a data type of face corner byte color, which is exactly what the stock importer tries to stuff the point cloud in. And that was the root of the problem because it's a face corner. What is the corner of a face corner of a vertex? Silly fellow, there are no corners. So now it's super easy to get your own point cloud in. Open the example.blend file, delete the default fractal. I've waited a very long time to say that. File, import, Stanford apply as verts. Select verts and colors only. Once your file loads, go to modifiers, geometry nodes, instances. Boop. There you go. In the Geometry Nodes tab, we see a very familiar node tree. And of course, we see the rotation and scale inputs, and there are so many cool things to be done here. This verts material here is also very basic and really just begs to be tinkered with. The imported colors are now just colors, so you can add them and mix them with almost any sort of material. Even the awesome PBR uh, photorealistic materials you can find online for free. And then they just work. It's, God, it's so much fun. I love it. Another really cool new feature in 3.1 that we can exploit now is the brand new point cloud render mode for cycles. In fact, we just barely made the deadline to get featured in the 3.1 release notes. Yay! So this image is 5.9 million spheres. Not UV spheres or icospheres, but rather mathematical spheres similar to CSG objects. This renders stupid fast, at the cost of somewhat limited flexibility for now. At the moment, it only renders spheres, and you can only see it in rendered mode. But you can tweak the scale of them and make the materials as complicated as you like. Note that despite almost 6 million spheres, there's only two triangles in this scene, and that's the ground plane. This new render mode was just added, and like geometry nodes, should only get better with time. Now, let's have a look at the mesh workflow. Importing a mesh is really easy. Back in our example.blend file, delete the default fractal. I just love saying that. File, import, Stanford ply as verts. Leave the box unchecked. Import. Go to the Materials tab. Select the Verts material. And we're done. No geometry nodes needed for this. And so this will work directly in Blender 3.0. And if you really wanted to, you can assemble a point cloud in 3.1, like we just did. Apply all the modifiers. Save it as a blend file. Open the blend file in 3.0. And you'll probably have to tab into edit mode. Select mesh, normals, recalculate outside, or shift N, and you can get nice results. Photogrammetry. We've all seen those gorgeous scans that look kind of like this. This is probably the best one I've ever been able to pull off my smartphone. Well, if you've ever tried it, you no doubt have had a few that look like this. So what do you do with a scan like this? I mean, it's, it's got enough good data that maybe you want to try and clean it up a bit, you know, and it, it might be useful. 
I usually go with the Visual SFM to MeshLab workflow that Gleb Alexandrov posted back in 2016 in this tutorial. When you run the Poisson Mesh Reconstruction filter on a scan like this that has big gaps, you will get these big smooth patches across it. Of course, that's the brilliance of Poisson. It generates watertight meshes. That's, that's its strong point. Unfortunately, watertight doesn't always mean artistic. I mean, sure, the gaps are filled, but now we have this really irregular sort of detail to utterly smooth. And you yeah, probably have to get in there in sculpt mode with a texture brush and, and try to get all of this to make sense. No, that's not necessarily bad if, if you enjoy that kind of thing. I do. I'm, I've done it. But it's it adds an additional step in the workflow for a model that you're not even sure at this point that you're going to be able to salvage. I mean, how much time do you want to invest in this thing? So as an alternative, when I get a degenerate point cloud like this, you degenerate, I'd rather just go through the point cloud workflow from before and you see the difference. By just gluing geometry to the actual data points, we can get a much better idea if this scan can be used as an asset. So now we just quickly toss in some emissive spheres, scatter a couple little potato rocks from Blender's rock generator, and yeah, okay. I mean, it's not a scientifically pristine photo scan, but it definitely looks cool. And I would say this is a recovered asset now instead of a wasted afternoon of sculpting and cussing. What's next? About a million years ago, back in college, they taught us the programming method of make it work, then make it pretty. Well, she works, but she's not real pretty yet. I'm positive I can make it run faster. I haven't looked at the core file I.O. module at all. That's probably where the bottleneck is at. Um, the handmade one I wrote for Taco Voxel is quite fast, and I'm confident that I can apply some of that performance over to the Blender version. Well, that's really all I brought. I made all the toys and I give them to everybody and I really look forward to seeing what people make with these things. So once again, thank you for having me. I'm Michael Prosca from Tombstone Tumbleweed Art. Let us all have more Blender fun. Peace, my friends.